Well, good morning. So glad you chose to worship at Life Church, whether you're watching online or gathered here. We're so glad each and every one of you are here today. Uh, last weekend, my youngest son got married, Daniel, to his high school sweetheart, Kalani. And so excited about that. And the venue had limited space. So they, they could not invite everyone. So I wanted to share that with you. And thank you for supporting this couple. And, you know, they're excited about life. They're excited about what's before them. And they want to do significant things with their lives or dreaming big and you know, everybody wants their life to count, right? No one desires to live a life that's unproductive. All of us want our lives to mean something. Did you know that even though you want your life to count and be productive, God wants your life to be productive as well? In fact, in John 15, Jesus said this in verse 8, This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 16, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Jesus says, I chose you for a purpose. What is that? To bear fruit. You prove yourself that you're really a follower of Jesus Christ, really a disciple by doing what? By bearing fruit. And most importantly, he says, we bring God glory when we bear fruit, when we're productive. So it is essential that I live a productive life. It is essential. It's not an option for us as Christ followers. It's essential. We're called to do it. We show ourselves to be disciples when we do it, and we bring God glory and honor when we do it. So we're to live productive lives. The question is, how do we do that? How can we live productive lives? We're going to talk about that today as we continue our series called The Marks of Following Jesus. Today we're going to look at a very famous parable uh, that's going to paint a very practical picture for us on really how to be fruitful. Uh, this parable we're about to look at is so important. It's mentioned in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They, they all three talk about this. This series is a verse-by-verse kind of chapter-by-chapter walk through the gospel of Mark. Mark is one of the Jesus stories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all share stories. The gospel is about Jesus, and Mark is just one of them. It's about a new king bringing in a new kingdom, giving us a new mission. And so we're talking about that. We've spent weeks now talking about the new king, kind of looking up and who this new king is, Jesus Christ, son of God, we found out, son of man, we found out, that he is healer, he is teacher, he is forgiver. And so we're excited about this new king. But a few weeks ago, he kind of changed gears. The focus isn't so much on new king. He'll still talk about that, but now it's kind of new kingdom. From up focus to inward focus. How do we live with one another? How do we live productive lives? How do we act in this new kingdom he has established and is establishing? And so we're about a year and a half into his three-year ministry. We're halfway into his ministry. And we're walking through. And we've already seen Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we've been for the first three chapters of Mark. We're already seeing he's bumping heads with religious people, religious leaders, causing much, much of vexation for them, much frustration for them. And he's not the most religious person, Jesus. And so he doesn't follow all their religious legalism. And so they're having a hard time with him. And we saw last time when Pastor Tim was here, he talked about the new family Christ is forming. Not so much a religious people, but a people who just want to follow him and do the Father's will, and who will live in this new kingdom together. Well, today we're in Mark 4, and uh, we're beginning the first verse here. It says, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Again, this is where he goes time and time again. Remember, there's so many people following him. The masses are following him, and so it's hard for him to be in a city. He has to stay outside of the city areas. He can't even sit down for a meal in the city. He, there's too many people in the city. He has to stay outside in open areas like the Sea of Galilee, uh, the lake, open areas like that. And again, the lake is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you see the map on the screen behind me, just to remind you of the geography. We're up in the northern part of Israel. He spends about a year and a half up here in Galilee, this northern part up here. And there's a little circle there, that body of water. It's not very big, about 13 miles long, 8 miles wide. It's fresh water. It's not uh, seawater, but it's called a sea. Uh, and that's where they would fish, and that's where he's standing outside on this shore right now, teaching the crowds. And it says back in verse 1, it says, The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out in the lake. While the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So religious leaders have rejected him officially. We saw that last time. But the crowds are still flocking to him. 
and they're wanting to hear his teaching. Uh, Mark does not record it for us, but Matthew does. He has, he's already given his famous Sermon on the Mount on this hillside there. That's already happened. People are coming to him for teaching. They're coming to him for healing, as we've seen so far in the book of Mark. And to help with crowd control, because they're pushing and pressing in on him to, for healing, he got away from them, got into a boat, pushed it away from the shore, and now he has a floating pulpit. And he's kind of preaching from the boat. Really, he's more, he's more teaching. His rabbis would stand when they preach, but they would sit when they taught. So he's sitting in this boat, just kind of teaching the people. And it kind of formed a natural amphitheater there. The water would, vo would uh, the, the voice, his voice would bounce off the water, and the people could all hear. In fact, a sound engineer did a study of this area, and they found out a single orator standing off in a boat offshore like this, when they're speaking, thousands could hear because the, the, the water kind of carries the voice. And that's what we see Jesus doing here as he is speaking to them as their kind of a form of crowd control and security, him being there in the boat. Verse 2 says, he taught many things by parables. So now we, he's talking about parables. If you were here last week, you heard Pastor Tim talk about this, Mark 3, 23. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. This is the first time last week where he begins talking, Mark does, about parables. So now he's going to do it again. He's going to talk today. We're going to read a parable today. We're going to look at a parable today. The word parable means to cast alongside. That's what the word means, to cast alongside. And so it was a, you would take a known truth and you would cast it alongside an unknown truth. A physical reality would be put next to a spiritual reality to connect and compare the meaning between the two. It was, a, it was an earthly story to make a heavenly point. And that's what a parable actually was. It could be an axiom, it could be an analogy, an illustration. But Jesus, when he told parables, they're usually just stories. Sixty parables, over 60 are told in the Gospels by Jesus Christ. 35% of his teaching ministry in the Gospels is basically he's telling of parables, these simple stories. They were meant to reveal truth and also to conceal truth. We'll talk about that in a moment, to reveal and to conceal. There's always some kind of shocking element in the parable. We'll also see that in just a moment. So let's talk about the parable. Let's talk about the parable. This is the first parable that we're going to see here in the Gospel of Mark that Mark records for us, and it's, it's, it's probably one of the most famous ones of all. Verse 2 says, He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching he said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Listen to what I'm going to tell you, he says. Uh, that word is mentioned ten times in this chapter. Jesus wants you to hear. It's a command. Uh, he wants you to hear about this farmer who goes out to sow seed. Now, most of them knew what it meant to sow or plant seed. They have done this before. In fact, many of the listeners probably were farmers themselves. There on the Sea of Galilee, on the shores there, the flatlands, before they went up to the mountains, the flatlands are all kinds of farming lands there. And probably why he's telling this story, probably there are farmers all around the area sowing seed. So hearing him say it, they're looking up, seeing all these farmers around sowing their seed, and they're understanding. And they didn't have tractors or, or planters. They used a, mech, a, a, a technique called broadcasting. Broadcasting meant you had a bag on your shoulder full of seeds. You reach your hand in, a handful of seeds, and you would just fling those seeds and it'd cast them all over the soil, broadcasting. Of course, in our day and time, radio and TVs picked up that term and stole that term for broadcasting, a signal out, but it was an agrarian term originally for broadcasting seed. And that's what's happening. Everybody knew this story. Everybody, again, it's a familiar truth that's going to co communicate something that's unknown to people. And so as he was scattering, verse 4 says, the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And so there he is, he, he's casting seed, and there, and there were some pathways out there. These paths are out there. They weren't, there were paths all throughout the area. And, and with those paths, they're about three feet wide, and they didn't have actually fences in that day and time around property. They would have pathways around property and pathways through property. It's how you traverse within a field, how you travel from village to village was through a pathway. We saw a few weeks ago, Jesus Christ got his hand slapped by the religious leaders. Why? Because him and his disciples were going on a pathway through a field, and they picked up some grain and began to eat on the Sabbath. And it was one of these pathways, these hardened pathways that he is walking through. And, and everyone knows about this pathway and how they're dry, they're uncultivated, they're, they're beaten hard, and 
a farmer would never intentionally put seed on the path, but as he's broadcasting, the wind might catch the seed, and of course it might carry it onto the path, and so some seed ends up on the path. And back in verse 4 it says, the birds came and ate it up, right? Birds did back then, but birds do today. They cause trouble, right? And that's why we have scarecrows, right? To scare the birds away from the garden, hopefully so. They didn't have scarecrows back then, but the, where you saw a farmer sowing seed, a bird was really nearby watching to see that seed fall on the pathway. It wouldn't penetrate the path. It'd be on top of the path. The bird would swoop down and have a little breakfast there in the moment. Luke, when he records this story as an element, Luke says that not only were the, sea, the, the birds swooping down taking the seed, but whatever the birds didn't take, people would trample upon, it says, and they would basically crush the seed underfoot. So the hard path was not a good place for seed. That's one soil. Another kind of soil is in verse 5. It says some fell on the rocky places, it says, where it didn't have much soil. And so you have these rocky places. Now, when, you, when I say rocky places, you're thinking probably there about having rocks under the ground. And, but that, it means more than that. In fact, the word used here refers to a, a mass of connected rock. Not a bunch of loose individual rocks. You can, easy, you can get those out with a shovel pretty easily. But a mass of connected, a bed of limestone, basically. A limestone bedrock that's under a short level of, of soil and a bunch of bedrock under that. Israel was filled with this limestone bedrock. In fact, the rabbis used to joke and say when God created rocks, he made a mistake and dumped them all in Israel. Now, we know that's not true because a lot got dumped here as well, right? We know how that works. When we were doing our construction project here to build this building, we had to dig down deep on the south end. You see here on the screen here, here's a cross section. This is why you have a hard time planting trees in your yard right here. Right? Uh, when I was newly married, we came here to start this church. I wanted to impress Helen. I go, honey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a fence in our backyard. I'm trying to impress her. I got my post hole digger and my iron rod. And, and she's all, don't you think you should rent like one of those jackhammers? I'm like, no, I got this, I got this. And with a hurt back and like months later, I got it done, right? <laughs> but I should listen to my wife because this is what we dealt with. And here you have seed that goes down, but where can the seed, you see the little root, these roots are struggling, right? Where can the roots actually go? Not very far down. Roots with trees force their way down, but grass it really suffers, and, and smaller plants, it's much more difficult than that. So back to verse 5, it says that it sprang up quickly because there was the soil was shallow. The roots could not go down, so the plant just went up, right? And the plant springs up quickly, it says, because the soil was shallow. Verse 6, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they were withered because they had no There was no room for the root. And, and so it could not grow in this area very well. It, it, it would root a little bit, but, but because when it got hot between the two, the early and late rains, you have the summer in between that time, sun comes out, it evaporates. Whatever moisture is left in the soil, there is nothing there. There is no deep root to access water. And so it says here they wither up because they have no root. In fact, Luke, in his gospel, when he tells the same parable, he adds that there was no moisture at all in the soil. So you have a hard path. Sea can't penetrate. You have a rocky limestone where sea can penetrate, but it can't go far, it can't root. Then you have a third kind of soil, verse 7. Other sea fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. This is kind of deceptive here. You might be digging a little bit as a farmer, and you might kind of realize, oh, I can go a little deeper here. Because oftentimes they would sow the seed, broadcast it, then they would plow afterwards. We plow, and then we sow. They had a, a process where they'd sow sometimes, then plow. And so they're plowing, and they realize, oh, there's not a whole lot of limestone under here. We're okay. But what they don't see is there's, there's roots there from former weeds and seeds from former weeds. And thorns, they begin to grow. So now we're talking about thorns. Right, these thorns, these thorns that grow up, and the thorns, as they grow up next to the, to the new plant, the thorns grow up, and they, they begin choking out the life of this, this new seed. Because thorns do that, right? Thorns and weeds, they, 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 they grow up, and they begin robbing moisture and robbing space and robbing nutrients and, and robbing sun because they're shaded, and, and, they, and they begin choking out the life of, this new, of these new plants that are growing 
And, he, and Mark says it choked the plants. Back in verse 7, it choked the plants, and they did not bear grain. So you have basically this path, and you have this rocky soil, and you have this thorny soil that it, the root does catch, but it, it chokes out the life because there's thorns and weeds in the area. And then he got, talks about one more form of soil, the good soil. Verse 8, still another seed fell on the good soil, and it came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. So now we have good soil, not a path, not rocky, not thorny, but now you have this good soil. It's just good soil. It's deep, it's soft, it's rich, it's clean, and not all soils are equal. <laughs> and this soil is superior, he says. And of course, the shocking element of this story is, if you go back to verse 8, it says that it multiplied 30 and 60 and 100 times over. A typical yield was about 1 to 10. Not 1 to 30 or 1 to 60 or 1 to 100. Ancient records say it was not unheard of to have these kinds of high yields, but it was extremely rare. That was kind of the punch of the parable. Wow, you can be fruitful. Not just a little fruitful, but really productive if you have the right kind of soil. That's the punch. We see the parable, and now let's look at the people. The people who he's talking to about this. Verse 9, Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This phrase, if you have ears to hear, let them hear, is mentioned in the Old Testament, mentioned in the New Testament numerous times. It's an important phrase. Let them hear, let them heed. In fact, the word hear is mentioned 13 times in this one chapter. Jesus wants us to hear something. Did you know it's possible to have an ear and not hear? In fact, it's possible to have two ears and not hear. I think my wife just said amen. <laughs> she's shaking her head. She, she's about to get up and dance. I don't know what's happening over here. I don't, why are you doing this to me? But it is true. She'll say, Brian, I, I think you're listening, but I'm not sure you hear the words coming out of my mouth, right? Jesus said it's possible actually to have ears and not hear. There are only two types of people in this world, those who have ears only and those who have ears and hear. And Jesus is going to ask us, which one are you? Man, communication can be hard, can it not? All right, there we go. It is the number one problem in marriage, in the workplace, in parenting, in church. I don't care where you go. If you have relationships, you've got communication problems. And a lot of times because we have ears, but we don't really hear. It's a problem. And when it comes to being fruitful, being productive, we're going to find out you have to have ears that hear what God is saying, the Spirit is saying to his churches. I'm older than many of you in this room, not all of you, many of you. And, and I remember growing up, they had these like, things called CB radios. And, and people were like, truckers would use them, but people were like buying them for their houses. And there's a little famous phrase, anybody got their ears on? Remember that? Got the, and that's what Jesus is saying today. Anybody got their ears on? I know you got ears on, but are they, are they, are you hearing? Are you hearing? Verse 10, he was alone. The 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. There's a time gap here. We're not sure how much time passes, but he's on the, he's on the shore teaching them the, the crowds of, through this parable. He talks about a path. He talks about rocky soil. He talks about uh, thorny soil. He talks about good soil. These leaves. <laughs> and they're not quite sure what he's talking about. But sometime later, he, now he's not with the crowd, he's with the 12. And others who are following him. And, and he begins telling them the secret of the kingdom of God. He said, he said, it's been given to you. The word secret here is a Greek word, musterion. We get the English word mystery from that. And it's used oftentimes in the, in the Bible. Paul uses it time and time again in his writings. But the word mystery, mysterion, or secret, when it's used in the Bible, it's not what we think of. When we think of mystery, we think of something you can't understand, something that's hard to comprehend, something you've got to figure out. That's not the biblical use of mystery. 
The biblical use of mystery or secret is the idea something was hidden in the past, but now God is revealing it to some. It has its roots way back in the Old Testament with Daniel. And, and God, God has revealed something. Now he's revealing it to some. Not to everybody, but the mystery of the kingdom. He said, he said, he said I'm giving this, he said, to you. Not the crowds on the shore, but to the 12 and the others who are following. In fact, Jesus said in John 15, 15, I have called you friends, he tells his disciples. For everything, not something, but everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I'm telling you the mystery. I'm telling you the secret that no one's known in the past. I'm letting you know. You guys are on the inside. You have ears to hear. Your ears hear. So I'm going to, you're on the inside now. You're following me. I'm going to tell you the secret. So you have some on the inside, some on the outside. Some have ears to hear, some don't have ears to hear. Remember, we've been talking at our church about this, this life path. This life path is kind of a visual picture of the ministry of Jesus and how he related to people. He took people through four stages of growth in his ministry, his three-year ministry. And for the first year and a half, he's mainly just going and saying, hey, come experience me. Come and see. I'm doing teaching. I'm doing miracles. I'm healing. And the crowds are flocking to him for a year and a half. They're coming and watching the greatest show on earth. And they're watching what he does. But about a year and a half into his ministry, uh, I, I said about a year into his ministry, I should say about a year into his ministry, he tra- changed gears, and he starts saying, hey, come and follow me. Not, the whole, not everybody, but just some, come and follow me. He goes from experience to connect. Come and connect with me. Come connect with others. Come follow me. Not just come and see, but come and follow. And then about a year and a half into his ministry, where we are now in our story, about a year and a half into his ministry, halfway point, he goes beyond experience to connect to influence. Beyond come and see and, and, and come and follow to come and be with me. And he picks 12 apostles. And, and he's, he's influencing them. It's those 12 he's influencing. And those he's connected with who are, who are following him. Those are the ones who are, who are on the inside. They have ears to hear. But the crowd, the ones on the bottom step, the ones who are, who are just coming because they want success, right? Heal my child. Fix my marriage. Help my finances. Give me a job. Those of you who are coming to God as a cosmic slot machine, as a genie, as a cosmic Santa Claus, God, meet my needs. It's about their success. Those don't really have ears to hear. It's about them, not about him. But those who are actually connecting with him, following those who are actually really influenced by him, they're not on the outside. They're on the inside. It's not about their success. It's about, it's about really surrender. Not their will, but his will. And he's began talking to these people. He's frustrated, Jesus is, with those in the crowd who have ears but won't hear. He wants people to connect and influence with it. There's so many who just want to experience him only. And he's having a hard time with that. In fact, in, verse, in Matthew 13, verse 34, it says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd. The experience level people. The crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them, the crowd, without using a parable. So now, at the, basically at the halfway point of his ministry, he's not even giving like the Sermon on the Mount anymore, like to the crowd, the practical Sermon on the Mount. He's just speaking in parables to them. Hey, I got four, you got four soils, right? He's talking about soils. He's talking about, he's talking in code somewhat. Because parables do what? They reveal and they also conceal. They don't have to have hearts to hear, ears to hear. So he's not really talking to them except in parables. Those on the inside, the 12, those who are following him, he talks to them more and explains the parable. Those on the outside, he doesn't do that as much. In fact, verse 11 says this, Mark 4, 11, but those, to those on the outside, not the inside, but the crowd, on the outside, everything is said in parables. Right? I'm going to reveal some things and I'm going to conceal some things. And so a parable does two things. It reveals to those who have an open heart to God his truth, but it conceals to, to those who have a closed heart from God his truth. A, a parable does two things. It, it's, it's a work of grace to those who are open to God. It's a work of judgment to those who are closed to God. Because they don't really hear what he's saying. He goes on to quote here Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, when he says this, so that, verse 12, he quotes Isaiah, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. 
Now, this is a controversial verse. Everybody, what, what is, what is, what, is Jesus saying he doesn't want them to be forgiven? Is he like telling parables and codes that they actually will not ever experience salvation? Is he withholding salvation from these people? At face value, it looks that way. Is his intent like to speak in codes so are kind of left on the outside? And again, this is, it could be a long discussion. I'll just summarize it by saying this. This isn't necessarily speaking of purpose. I'm speaking of parables to keep you on the outside. This speaks more really of result. Because you're on the outside, because you refuse forgiveness, I'm going to speak in parable. You don't understand what I'm saying anyway. A stubborn refusal to believe in Jesus eventually leads to an inability to believe in him. People who constantly reject truth over time lose their ability to comprehend truth when it's presented to them. That's what's happening here. The crowd, the religious leaders, they've been hearing truth, but they kept pushing back against it. Now they can't even understand it anymore. There's a spiritual principle here. If you continually push against the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you get to the point where you're no longer sensitive to his work at all. Pastor Tim talked about this last week, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you know, basically attributing the work of God to, the, to Satan himself and just being so hardened to the work of God. And that's where these guys are. Like Pharaoh in the Old Testament, you know. Did God harden his heart or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? Yes. The same sun that hardens clay also softens wax. It all depends on the condition of the material. It's the same work of God, but some are experiencing grace, some are experiencing judgment. Some are experiencing grace, the wax is softened. Others are experiencing judgment, the, the, the clay is hardened. We're going to talk about, talk about that. It's the condition of the heart that makes the difference. The parables were kind of a judgment. In the Old Testament, they were used as a judgment. They, they would reveal things to those who are seeking God. They would conceal things for those who are pushing back against God. And Jesus says, hey, all those crowds on the seashore, I heard, a, I heard a whole lot of amens from that crowd, but most of them had no idea what I was talking about. So he's about to talk about the principles of the parable. Not with all the people, but just the insiders. And they chose, they were not insiders because Jesus chose them to be insiders. They were insiders because they had an open heart to Jesus. They had ears to hear. Verse 13, it says, Jesus said to them, do you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? He said, you've got to understand this parable here. This is the parable. This is the parable of parables. This is the source parable, the foundational parable. This one parable unlocks every other parable. If you don't get this one, you won't get any of them. Why? Because the parable we're about to look at, or at least explain, we already looked at it, about to explain, is the parable about receptivity. How can I be fruitful and productive in my life? I'll just cut to the chase. You have to be receptive to the work of God in your life. And that's what Jesus is about to talk about here. So let's kind of dig deep into the dirt of the soils and talk about this popular parable. Verse 14, the farmer sows the word. Now he's, now he's explaining, he's interpreting the parable. Not to the crowd, but to the core. Right? Not the outsiders, but the insiders. He's the 12 and those who are following him who have ears to hear. He says, yeah, the farmer sows seed. That seed represents the word. Luke tells us in his gospel, it's the word of God. That's what it is. The message of the kingdom. I'm a new king, a new kingdom. I'm giving you my word now. I'm bringing this truth to you. And of course, the farmer, the sower, is God himself. In the Old Testament, God was the sower, sowing seeds into Israel. It's Jesus himself, and of course, by extension, it's you and I, all his followers. So look at it this way. Here, you look at it this way. So the sower is the Christian. It's you and me. We're all called to be sowers, to sow consistently, to sow generously and liberally. I'm not going to really sow anything there. No, I'll just sow there anyway. That's a path. Sow anyway. Sow the path. That's all right. Sow the thorns, sow the, the, the shallow dirt, sow, sow everywhere. Because we don't know it's a path. We don't know it's a rocky soil. We don't, we don't know the conditions of people's hearts. We just sow everywhere. What do we sow? Our own thoughts, our own philosophy, our political views? No, those mean nothing. We sow the word of God. That means everything. The seed is the word of God, not my opinion. My opinion means nothing. Someone said amen, all right. 
You and my wife both said that. Thank you very much. At the end of the day, all that really matters, honestly, is what God says. Now, people do try to make synthetic seeds that they create themselves. But no, no, let's let the seed be the seed. Let's let it be God's word. And we sow that out. His Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit inspired, implanted word in Scripture. That's what we share. And the soil we're about to find out in this parable is the hearts of people. The hearts of people. Now, notice, in the, we're going to notice in the parable, there are some constants here. The constant is the sower. It's the same sower on all four soils. The constant is the seed, the word of God. It's the same word of God in all four soils. The only variable that changes in the story is the soil. And notice it didn't talk about how the sower sows. He might sow quietly. He might sow loudly. He might be distinguished. He might be charismatic. Right? We, 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 we spend a lot of time trying to say, well, I really like the sower this way or the sower this way. I like the sower. You know what? The technique of the sower is not really that important. Not how he sows, it's what he sows is important. Whether you whisper or teach or preach or just share, it's are you sharing the word of God? That is what's important. And beyond that, the, the variable is the type of soil. Is it going to be what kind of hearts of people are you sowing into? This has been called the parable of the sower. It should be called the parable of the soils because the soul, the soul is the issue here. So verse 15 as you wrap up, we'll just kind of go through these and we'll unpack just the parable we heard earlier. The principles are loaded in here that Jesus explains to us now. He says, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word in, that is sown in them. So here you have this path that's really hard. And the seed cannot penetrate. The seed cannot infiltrate. It sits on top. And so these birds come and they snatch it up. And so there is no reception here. None. It can't penetrate. It's like putting seed out in the parking lot. It's not going to do anything. So here I must avoid having a hard heart that is resistant. Or the first four soils, the first one is a hard heart that is resistant. It can't be penetrated by the word of God. These narrow pathways, they were three feet wide and they were hardened any of you know anyone in your life who is hard and narrow-minded? You can't tell them anything. They know what they believe. They're going to push you back. That's, that's what he's talking about. That's the condition. You bring them here to church maybe, and, and maybe through the worship team, they say something, they sing something, and God speaks to you through the teaching God speaks to you. And you, you leave with that person, and you go, man, God spoke to me. And they go, they go the lights are kind of dim in there. What? I mean, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but that's all you got? And because it's the heart, it's the heart. Nothing penetrates. Now, again, this doesn't, does not mean we don't try to reach them. I love that he, he's so there anyway. But the reality is we shouldn't be surprised if they push back. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, this represents the religious leaders. They were hardened. They wouldn't receive truth. And there are all kinds of reasons why we become hardened. Pride. I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. Even God. Fear. I'm afraid God's going to make me be or make me do what I don't want to do. Bitterness. Someone hurt me one time or God hurt me and now I have this bitterness and I just don't want to let that go and it becomes an impediment to hearing. Regardless of how it happened, if you have a hard heart, you're not in a good place because the seed cannot penetrate. And it says here the birds, or he says here the bird represents Satan, will come and swoop it up. As someone who has a garden, who birds pick at his tomatoes, I like the fact that he compares birds to the demonic. <laughs> I've got some demon-possessed birds out there, and squirrels for that matter. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Jesus says, if you have a hard heart, Satan will take that away. Any truth God gives you. A hard heart, he says, is for the birds. 
I thought I'd try it. Anyway, okay. I was a little late, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, the pity laughter. I appreciate that. 16, others like the seed sown on the rocky places hear the word at once, receive it with joy. Okay, they hear the... So unlike the path, there is reception. There's reception. They receive the soil. And it says here, they receive it with joy. There's an emotional lift. But since they have no root, it lasts only a short time when the trouble of persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. There's reception, unlike the path soil, but there's no root. It can't go very deep because that limestone base. They might be excited. They might go, hey, Jesus. They might be a quiver in the liver, but it never goes beyond that. They go to youth camp, get all excited about Jesus. Two weeks later, they go, who's Jesus, right? Because it never takes root. I must avoid a shallow heart that is superficial. Not just a hard heart that's resistant, but a shallow heart that's superficial. All of us, me, you, all of us have things under the surface of our lives that get in the way of God putting root into us. And you know what those are if you're honest. Those strongholds, those sins you struggle with that that get in the way. In the ministry of Jesus, the crowd falls in this category. Man, they, they wanted healing, they wanted success, they wanted God to do something for them, but they never had roots that lasted. They wanted to be touched, but not transformed. And they didn't last long. And so they fell away when things got difficult. Let me tell you something. When things heat up in your life, if you don't have root, you'll fall away. In fact, if you have good soil, persecution, trials, tribulation brings you closer to God. If you have shallow soil with no root, the same things push you away from God. You had to have root. It's not about starting. It's about sustaining and enduring. You know what you call a plant with no root? A tumbleweed. Some of you, this is you. And I'm not saying that to be harsh. I'm saying that in reality. You never put roots down, and so you feel like you just kind of are spiritually, one spiritual high to another one, one emotional high to another one, one church to another one. You just kind of, you're just kind of blowing around out there. You, the, the roots aren't down. You've got to put some roots down. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know. What can I do? I, I don't have a hard heart. My heart is open. There is reception there, but, man, there's stuff underneath the surface of my life. I just can't penetrate any deeper in this. What do I do? Let me give you two words of encouragement. Here's the first word of encouragement. If you, if you think you're reception, receptive to God's word, but you feel like there's too much baggage underneath the surface of things to take root, first thing I would say is what you're doing right now is a good thing. Hearing his word, reading his word, praying. God's word has a way of basically going down within us and has a way of breaking those barriers up, that limestone, jackhammering it. So that's good. Second thing I would say this, if you admit you have roots that don't go down deep, instead of being a tumbleweed that goes here and there, what I would encourage you to do, and being by yourself, blowing here and there, find some other Christians and start living life with them in community. Go to a life group. Get involved in a group of somehow. Why? Because the scripture tells us that as we encourage one another, it keeps us from falling away and blowing away. While you don't have any roots to go down deep, what's going to keep you from blowing away? Other Christians you begin linking arms with. You know, redwoods are incredible trees. They grow up to 200, 250 feet. The biggest ones get up to under 350 feet. They're just huge ones. They have anywhere from a 10 to 15 foot diameter trunk. Think about that. A huge 15 foot diameter trunk. Over 250 feet tall. Did you know the root system of the average redwood is only about 6 to 12 feet deep? How could something grow over 250 feet tall but only go 6 feet down? What keeps them from falling over? I tell you what keeps them from falling over. A unique root system. Their roots don't go down. The roots go out and they intermingle with other redwoods and they literally hold each other up. That's a picture of Christian community. If your roots can't go down deep because of barriers, go out and link with other Christians. Say, hey, man, I got some things under my surface. I can't. But you know what? It will keep you connected and from being a tumbleweed Christian who blows away. Get connected. Then in verse 18, still others. He talks about the third soul now here. Or like seed 
among the thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Unlike the path, there's reception. Unlike the, the, uh, the rocky soil, the shallow soil, there's actually, there's actually some root, but there's no fruit. The problem is not what is under the seed. The problem is what is around the seed. Thorns. Weeds. I need to avoid a crowded heart that is distracted. The path represents a hard heart that's resistant. The rocky soil represents a shallow heart that is superficial. Superficial commitments don't last. And of course, now you have this thorny soul represents a crowded heart that is distracted. And the ministry of Jesus, again, this applies to the crowd. The crowd was very distracted by wanting to have their needs met. A preoccupied mind, uh, competing interests. I would tell you this, if you would say, I receive God's word and I'm letting my roots go down, but I still have a hard time being productive and producing fruit, it could be because you actually have this issue right here, a crowded heart. Way too many loyalties. And most of us in the American church, we're here. We've got reception to the Spirit and to God's Word. We've got root going down. The problem is not what's under us. The problem is what's around us. We have way too many loyalties. And Jesus actually mentioned some here. The worries of this life, the seedfulness of wealth, and desires for other things. Man, those haven't changed, have they? Word, the word worry means to divide. Doesn't worry divide your mind? It's hard to be productive when your mind is divided. Divide distracted thinking. Deceitfulness of wealth. As important as wealth is, as important as money is for us to live on, it's deceitful because it makes us think it's the answer, and it's not the answer. But we live so hard, and money drives us because greed can be a weed. And it drives us, and it consumes us, and it begins choking us. Many of us have enough to live on. We have nothing to live for. Nothing to live for because we've lost our purpose because we're so consumed with just making the next dollar and desires for other things, just all the stuff we want. This is the message for this church. I don't think your heart is hard, all of us, but some of us have things under the surface. We have shallow hearts. Others of us have things around us. We have crowded hearts that we've got to learn to deal with because it chokes out and makes it unfruitful. Did you know there are over 8,000 species of weeds in the world? 8,000. And some of you say, yeah, and 75% of those are in my backyard. <laughs> yes, I have them. Yes, all the confession. Y'all see that hand? I'll see that hand. I'll see that hand. Thank you very much. Good. We know it's like it's a problem. What do you have to do to grow a weed? Nothing. Exactly right. I've got a garden, and i got a man. I work hard, and I, you know, and I, I work hard in the garden. I still have tomatoes that struggle, and peppers that struggle, and, and the spinach that struggles, and peas that struggle. I do nothing for the weeds, and they do just fine. And weeds are a sign always of neglect. I'll just mow over them. I'll just rip them off the top. No, no. You got to dig those babies up by the root. But we don't do that. We neglect. And what God is doing in us, all these things come from the outside. We allow the weeds of worry, the weeds of chasing dollars, and the weeds of all these things to come and choke the life out of what God is doing. Be careful about that. You can't just plant a seed. You got to do something about the weed. You've got to take that out. And then finally, verse 20, others are like the seed sown in the good soil. Hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. What was sown? Unlike the path, there's reception. Unlike the rocky soil, there's root. Unlike the crowded soil, the thorns and weeds, there's fruit. And not as any fruit, it says 30 and 60 and, and 100. It's growing. I must have a receptive heart that is open. 
a receptive heart, not a hard heart, not a shallow heart, not a crowd heart, but a receptive heart that's open to God. It says here, they hear it and they accept it. It's open. They have a willing mind. They cooperate with God. And again, in the, in the story of Jesus, the religious leaders had a hard heart. The crowd had, the, had a shallow and crowded hearts. But it is the 12 of those who are following Jesus who have ears to hear, who have the receptive heart to open. James 1, 21, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let God implant his word in you. Receive that. It doesn't need to be about, I'm going to criticize that sermon and criticize that song and I'm going to criticize, you know, don't come as a critic. Come as somebody who says, I'm going to be submissive. God, what do you want to say to me? God, I'm going to take what you said personally. I'm going to take, what you said is not for my wife. It's not for the person over there. What you just said is for me. That's a receptive soil. It's good soil. It's good soil. It's rich. It's deep. It is fertile. It will grow. These are the ones who do the will of God, Jesus said. It's about receptivity. Why would God tell you to do something if you're not going to do it? God, please tell me what you want me to do so I can decide if I want to do it. Isn't that how we pray? God, tell me what you want me to do so I can debate with you. God says, if you're going to make up your mind anyway, I'm not going to tell you a thing. You don't have ears to hear. If you write me a blank check, God says, if your answer is yes before I say anything, you will hear. If you're fertile soil, receptive soil, you will hear. Fruitfulness is not about the seed. The seed's going to produce fruit. Fruitfulness is about where the seed lands. Are we open? When Luke recorded his gospel, he put it this way, Luke 18, 15, he fleshed it out a little more. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. An open and fruitful heart is one that you hear it, you retain it, and you persevere in it. You hear it. God, speak to me. Expose yourself to God's truth. You retain it. The word means you hold on to it. You own it. God, this is for me. You pos- it means to possess. It's not just a word. It's a word for me. I'm going to retain that. And then I'm going to persevere in it. It means to remain under it. I hear it. I own it. I remain under it. So it can produce its work in me. It can produce this work. You know, you can have a crop. You can have a harvest. This can be you right here. This can be you. That can be you. 30, 60, 100. But you can't have a hard heart or a shallow heart or a crowded heart. You have to have a receptive heart. And Jesus said, the promise is, he says here very clearly, if you hear it, retain it, persevere in it, this will happen. It's an essential mark of the new kingdom, that we are productive, we are fruitful. God is broadcasting his seed constantly. God is always throwing it out there. The question is, are you open to it? If you are open to it, it will hit you, and this will be you. How's your soil? How's your heart? Jesus said in John 15, 5, If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. If we're connected, you will produce fruit. If my word is in you, a hard heart that is resistant, a shallow heart that is superficial, a crowded heart that is distracted, a receptive heart that is open, which one are you? Which one are you? By the way, I don't think these are necessarily four people. These are four attitudes that can be any one of us at any time. These are four areas. You might have a receptive heart when it comes to your marriage. You might have a hard heart when it comes to your finances. You might have a superficial heart when it comes to your job. I don't know. I, here's my challenge to you. Think about your attitude across your life in different areas. Your attitude in different seasons and different areas of your life. Are you these things? Because the goal is... Whatever season I'm in, what my attitude should be, whatever area of my life, my attitude should be a receptive heart that is open. 
I have a friend of mine who died of a heart attack a few weeks ago. And I've never done this. I'm over 50 now, so I signed up for a heart scan. I'm going to get a heart scan. And they're going to take an x-ray of my heart or some kind of specialized x-ray. They're going to they're gonna look at my heart in pictures, all my arteries and everything. They're going to look at everything from actually head to toe. And I'm going to see what my heart is like. What if we could take a heart scan of you today? Not of your physical heart, but your spiritual heart. Which one would you be? Oh, go back. Which one would you be? And lastly, how's my heart? How's my heart? Will you pray? Head bowed and eyes closed. We have a prayer center in the back here, a prayer and care room. If you want to pray with anyone about anything, I encourage you to go to the prayer and care center as we wrap up today. While we sing this last song, as we're leaving after the last song, if you want to pray about any need, I encourage you to go to the prayer and care center. If you want to know about being a follower of Christ, what that looks like, go there. For all of us in this room today, we, we understand that Christianity is a faith of the word. Christianity is the faith of the word, the word of God, the word of Jesus. Because it's the faith of the word, we have to have ears that hear. May we have that. Do we have ears to hear today, Father? I pray that people would have ears to hear. I pray that in the different areas of our lives, in our attitudes, Father, I pray we would be people of receptive hearts. Not hard hearts or shallow hearts or crowded hearts, but receptive hearts. May we open ourselves fully up to you, Jesus. May we surrender. During this last song, as we prepare for our week ahead of us, may we just let go and surrender. Be receptive, be open to whatever God wants to do. Whatever word you're speaking now, even now in this service, Father, may we be open to it. May we have ears to hear Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We stand.